Chapter 9 is called Thermochemistry. Thermochemistry deals with the relationship between chemistry and energy, more specifically heat energy and chemical reactions. How does a chemical reaction relate to heat? And the picture here is a great example of heat exchange and chemical reactions. It's, you don't, you're not really looking at burning ice. Well, technically it is ice, it's just not water that's frozen, it's ethanol. And ethanol is a flammable liquid, so we know we can burn it. And when we burn ethanol, we know that we can generate heat. All right? So that's referred to as an exothermic reaction. Uh, a reaction or process that gives he releases heat is called exothermic. And as this, this frozen ethanol burns, it gives off that heat, and that heat is taken up by another process, by uh, the melting of the ice, of the ethanol ice, right? And so it takes up, up the heat, which is an endothermic process. So an endothermic process is a process where energy is taking up. And it can be either a reaction or a physical process. In this case, it's a physical process and, and a chemical reaction that's releasing the heat and a physical melting process that's taking up the heat. And that keeps the heat, that keeps the cool flame cool, okay? So this flame that's burning is actually not a hot flame. It's, it's a cool flame all the way down until it's all melted. And then, it, of course, once it's melted, it, the rest of it burns and you will feel some of the heat. Uh, we've and uh, the goal is for us to to be able to measure the heat that's given off and then relate it to the heat that's stored in these bonds, for example, right? So methane gas. Was just, this is a, just another combustion here, oxygen, and you've you've looked at these in previous chapters. Balance them. What we haven't seen is is we haven't seen heat as part of the product, right? We don't write that in, but it can be viewed as such, right? So here. This reaction releases heat, so we have heat as part of the products. If you have an endothermic reaction, meaning heat is taking up, you, you would see that heat written as part of the reactant. So, but, but, uh, and this is uh, communicated in different ways, as we will see later on. But, but right now, the reason we're studying this and we want to know more about it is if we can measure this heat without any heat loss, and without any work done on, on a system, we, we, can, we can calculate, we can predict the energy given off by any reaction and the energy stored in the, in the bonds or, or in products and reactants alike. So that's, that's the goal, the purpose of this chapter. Okay, so we already know a lot about energy, how it's measured and some of the units. We learned that in chapter E. The author of this book throws energy out and, and, and does some conversions with it, even mentions work, kinetic, and potential energy, as, as you remember, if you remember. And so in this case here, energy is anything that has the capacity to do work, right? And, and uh, in this case, the, the particular type of energy that we're heat interested in is heat, right? And so heat can flow from well heat will always flow from hot to cold right so just like the energy the hot flame will will warm up the colder ice that's where the heat energy is flowing from the combustion to the melting of the ice so from hot to cold heat always flows from hot to cold and, and hot and cold are not energy they're just uh, there we we just use it to measure where energy flows in and <clears throat> And so here we have, if you look at work, work is equal to force times distance. And just as a reminder, if I write the, write the units, the SI units for force, it would be kilograms times meters per second squared. That's a force. That's a mass that's acting, that's accelerating here. Meters per second would be speed and meters per second squared. Then that's that's a force that's pushing, right? Which means we are then moving the uh, object here, the kilogram, whatever it is, uh, by distance, so meters. So if you lump it all in, the SI units are kilograms times meters per, uh, squared per second squared. And we just simply make that a joule, right? If you remember, the joule is is uh, roughly the energy. One joule would be roughly the energy required for one heartbeat, 
and then we have calories and other units I'll show you in a second but it's important to to remember that these are the SI units so they, it becomes very useful when we do calculations to remember that uh, okay so here we're talking about kinetic energy kinetic energy is the energy of motion or, or and it can also be transferred from one form to another here, right? Or from one object to another. So the billiard table is, is a pretty reasonable example here. So you hit a a ball and it, it starts to move. That means an uh, energy in motion means we uh, the, the ball has kinetic energy, right? And then it hits another ball and stops, and so that energy is simply transferred to another ball, right? And, and in the process, of course, you're moving these objects, so work is being done, right? You stick energy in, you take the cue, you hit the ball, energy is transferred to the ball, it's moving, so you're, you're, you're doing work. And, and thermal energy, although it's very hard to observe this on this pool table, but thermal energy is, in fact, a, a type of kinetic motion, right? A type of kinetic energy. Think about... Uh, that ice that was melting earlier, right? As it, these these uh, atoms that are tied up in the ice, they are moving. Okay, they're not moving very much in the ice, and they're not very mobile, but they are moving. And as you heat them up, let's make this water, right? This water is, is easier to see because when you heat up water, it doesn't it doesn't actually undergo combustion. It just kind of it kind of melts, right? So if you have ice, you can melt it, and then these atoms are moving faster. And the more heat you put in there, the faster heat energy, the faster these atoms and particles can move. And if you put enough energy in there, you break that hydrogen bond, they are going to be moving around in the form of steam everywhere. And so that that is heat energy. And so it is a type of, of kinetic energy. And kinetic energy has, of course, a formula, right? Kinetic energy, E, is one-half mv squared, where m is the mass in kilograms, and v is the speed, meters per second. And if you square that, you have an acceleration. And what do you know? Those are the units of energy, or joules. That's going to equal a joule, right? And, uh, and so we also have, have kilograms, sorry, we have calories, and the calorie is is the energy required to melt one gram of water and not melt but to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree whereas as I said the, the joule is the energy required roughly for a heartbeat and and um, but and so the food calorie with capital C and we've been through this already is technically a a, a kilocalorie or a thousand actual calories and uh, and just as a reminder, the SI units, I'm going to write them down again, are going to be kilograms meter squared per second squared, which would be that of a joule. And you should be able to convert calories to joules and also kilowatt hours if I provided you with the conversion factor. Okay, all right. So then we have potential energy. And if you recall, we had uh, energy of motion, and we had potential energy, and we only named it that it's the it's the uh, distance between an object to uh, to the ground because there's the potential of gravity that can be pulling on it, right? And so here we have g, which is gravity. M again is the mass, and then gravity ha ha is, is is in meters. It's 9.8 meters per second squared meters per second squared and h is the height right so if i have i think the example was a house and there was some sort of object there and so uh, if we take the gravity and the distance here in meters that would be height once again we have kilograms times meters per squared per second squared so the potential energy also is in the form of joules and uh, <clears throat> And this is a nice little picture that relates the potential energy and the kinetic energy, right? So here we have water molecules on top of a dam. They have a certain distance h to the ground, so they have a potential energy, right? Um, and then as they approach this waterfall or, or dam, whatever it is, it... Uh, uh, it loses potential energy, right? So as you go, it's, they're going to start 
moving and they have potential energy and so they get closer and closer so they're you're converting the potential energy of the water molecules to kinetic energy until at the bottom uh, here of course they're still moving but uh, not so perhaps not uh, the perfect the most perfect example but it works all right here all right so you're converting potential energy to kinetic energy and once uh, once you reach the ground you are you no longer have potential and kinetic energy okay of course yes you do have it's moving downstream it's being pushed work is being done um, but it's more complicated so maybe I should get rid of that example in the future all right looking moving right along the law of conservation of energy right there is no free lunch is what this what this law is called it's the first law of thermodynamics energy may be converted from one form to another but the total quantity of energy must remain the same right so it never is lost so the total change in energy of, of the universe is equal to the change in energy of the system times the change in energy of the surroundings all right and thermodynamics is the study of energy and its interconversions and so we're doing thermochemistry and so we're only interested in heat energy and how it relates to chemical reactions all right so let's take a closer look here we uh, we can we can uh, we have different kinds, not just heat energy, but heat energy or thermal energy is, is really what we're interest, uh, interested mostly. We already know it's kinetic energy associated with, with molecular motion, right? Not a car in motion, but the atoms and molecules that are moving inside of a beaker, for example, where we are taking out a chemical reaction. And so we can interconvert these, right? So nuclear and chemical energy are, are almost the same. It's potential energy. Energy stored in the bond somewhere in the structure, like methane, <clears throat> has the potential to, to lose its energy if we burn it or if we release it with a chemical reaction. So we can actually we can use that chemical re uh, uh, energy and we can convert it to heat energy, right? And then we can use that heat energy and we can use it to warm up uh, a cup of water or something right we can also have have electrical energy you can have nuclear power you can have nuclear energy where you have a radio chemical uh, a radio process that's that gives also will give off heat and then you can use the steam given off and that's how nuclear power plants work in a nutshell <clears throat> they they give off steam you turn a you turn a turbine so you have mechanical energy mechanical energy turns that into electrical energy the electrical energy is sent through a wire and goes to your house and then you can convert it to whatever energy you want including thermal again to make some coffee so these are these are just a few examples of of uh, chemical uh, not chemical but of energy and how they can be converted and uh, again our main focus is going to be on heat energy and uh, just another illustration of of how energy can be converted right so and and a closer look at system and surroundings so let's call this spring here the system so this the, the, the spring is our system and right now we put some energy into the system and put a uh, by by pressing down on it right and so everything that is where energy can be transferred let's say the person in the room everything surrounding the spring would be the room so the room that this is in is are the surroundings and so you can transfer the energy to the surroundings and so all you have here is the spring being released and transferring the energy to to uh, the ball the ball starts to go in motion so that's kinetic energy <clears throat> and if we consider the ball the and everything around it the surroundings and look at what's on the right here uh, yeah, right so this this was the system which is the spring and it's it transferred a quarter of its energy to the surroundings here right so the surroundings picked this up and so this is just to to show you so let's say the surroundings had an energy that was a quarter full and so that energy was then transferred here as you can see so so you should have the total energy this a quarter right plus one half is always going to be three it's going to be three quarters right so so the delta 
E delta is the change in energy of the system equals negative delta E of the surroundings, right? So this went down by by a quarter minus one half. So delta E is minus one half, and and delta E of the system is plus one half. But overall, if you add it all up, this is the same energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, and that's uh, that's a law internal energy right and so this is what we're interested in in the chemical lab right so the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of a system makes up a substance right so the total energy of a substance here is going to be equal to kinetic energy and potential energy and internal energy so we're going to make u internal energy but what happens in the lab is we do something in a in a beaker we 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 don't have we don't move the beaker it stays put and and we don't we don't so we don't move it up or down so there's no potential or kinetic energy it stays put the the change in in kinetic energy and potential energy of the system is is going to be zero uh, which means that the energy the total energy of the system is going to be equal to the internal energy and so the internal energy therefore then is e or just uh, yes, just E, not total, but E, and so we are interested in the change of energy, and so the change of energy is equal to the energy of the final product minus the energy of the initial product, right? So let's say we do a, a combustion reaction, and it, uh, we have, let's say it's methane, and mes methane has some sort of energy that's, let's say there's a, that's, okay, let's make it 150 joules, and then if you burn it, the products, water and carbon dioxide, have energy of 5, right? So, so the change here of energy is, is going to be minus 145, right? So 5 uh, minus 150 is going to be minus 145. So a negative change in energy in, in implies a uh, a negative uh, an exothermic process or energy release. So a negative delta E is is uh, is energy released. Okay, and so we can relate that to a reaction as such here that the change in energy, which is what I've done here. So. And, and so this happens to be a state function. Now what that means is, if I carry out this reaction and I have to put some energy in to begin with or, or I, I boil it in a beaker and I stick a lot of energy in it, that energy is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is not how I got there, but uh, what the change in energy is of the products and the reactants. Okay, so a state function is is a mathematical function whose, re whose result only depends on the initial and the final conditions, right? So if the energy given off by methane is 145 kilojoules, and we can measure that, but in order to get there, we, 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 we had to uh, boil it for an hour, and I walked away to the bathroom and uh, boiled it for may way longer than I needed to, meaning I stuck a lot of energy, and it doesn't matter. That energy is irrelevant, and so the... the, the what what you can think of a state function uh, like altitude, right? So if the change in altitude here is if, if they're a mountain climber and he, he goes up and the change in altitude is, is 10,000 feet here, right? And it doesn't matter how he got there. You know, it doesn't matter if there's somebody who walked up like this and put 12 miles in it. The change is just 10,000 feet. Or somebody who went straight up has the same change in altitude. They are completely equal here. It doesn't matter if it took them three days or, or five minutes to climb up that hill. Uh, the path doesn't matter. Only the change in position here, or the, then that's what a state function is. Uh, <clears throat> this is just some summaries here. We've already looked at system and surroundings. The system is simply your beaker where your aqueous reaction is taking place. For example, and a lot of reactions, as we know from last chapter, are aqueous. And your reaction vessel, that's the system. And the surroundings is, of course, what uh, the, the, anything outside of that, that beaker, right? Uh, or you can even be more specific if, if, uh, if your reaction is aqueous. Let's say you have... Uh, 
something like sodium chloride um, or, or ammonium chloride, which is if you dissolve it, 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 it takes up it takes up heat, and and so your surroundings are actually then then the water, right? You're dissolving it in water, and the water is just the vessel holding it holding it, uh, it tight, right? So it, it can be as simple as that. And then what we're interested in is heat, and we're gonna call heat, we're going to abbreviate heat as Q, right? The energy that flows in or out of the system. And that's what we want to measure, right? And so there's this thermal equilibrium where where you have uh, heat flowing in and out until you, you can put like an, uh, an ice cube in the water and it's going to exchange heat until it gets to a certain temperature, right? The, the ice is going to warm up and, and the water that's giving off the heat to, to warm up that ice cube or melt it is going to cool down. So you have a heat flow there from the ice cube to, to the warmer water and at some point it's going to reach an equilibrium temperature. That's what thermal equilibrium is. <clears throat> and so we call the heat of the reaction then Q or the delta, uh, delta H. Uh, H is going to be enthalpy. We'll get there. Forget I said that. And uh, and then just as a reminder, exothermic and endothermic process, we already determined that if you have a negative change in energy or a negative Q, it's a, you have heat that's being released. And if it's a positive Q or, or a positive change in energy of the system, then it's an endothermic process. And as I said, endothermic processes, you have a, a positive change in energy. Energy is taken up by the system. Okay, so we already know this, that we know that, uh, that energy of the system is equal to internal energy and that the change in energy of the system here, this would be the system, is equal to Q plus W, right? So we have some sort of work that we have to consider. And, uh, uh, but, but if we don't have... If we keep volume constant, right? You 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 need you you have to associate work with distance, right? You have have force times distance, right? And so that distance can, if you're expanding something, that's in the form of volume. So if you are keeping, if you can keep the volume consistent, that's what Q V here is, right? So so ideally, we don't want to do any work. We want to keep the volume constant and then delta E, the change of the system of internal energy or a change of the system of energy equals equals Q. All right, and we have to have that little V in there. Let's take a look at a couple of, of real life examples of exothermic and endothermic processes here, right? So it's simply the reverse process here. Here you take charcoal and you burn it, you form carbon dioxide is carbon and two oxygens forming carbon dioxide mm. and, and that's an exothermic reaction here so heat would be given off and if we simply plot the energy of the reactants here uh, on a scale on an x scale where internal energy goes up they have higher energy than the product here where the product is carbon dioxide so that simply means energy was given off and so sometimes what you will see and you will see the energy here internal energy and then this you call it a reaction pass or reaction coordinate All right so this just kind of shows you the path and it's a little bit more more detailed All right so here's the energy of carbon and o2 carbon solid and O2 gas. In order to get those two to react, you have to stick a little bit of energy in. So the energy of these two goes up at first, and then you kind of can follow what's going on here. Of course, we're not interested in the energy that was stuck in at all. This is in a later chapter, but this is just what's happening. Then once you get this reaction going, the bonds are breaking, the O2 bonds are breaking, and, and the new bonds are formed, the carbon and oxygen bonds are formed. Now energy is released, and at some point the reaction is done. Right? And so you get CO2, which has an energy that's lower, right? And so you can measure the difference. You know, that's why it's a state function. It doesn't matter how much energy we stuck in here, right? So if that is negative, right? If delta E is smaller than zero, a de delta E is negative. We have an exothermic reaction, and heat is part of the, the products. If we do the reverse here, right? So here we can do the same thing. We can have E 
and I'm just going to say reaction coordinate RC. We have CO2. We stick energy in. See how? And then it's the same idea. And so we're only interested in the delta E here. Now delta E is going to be positive, which means it's endothermic. So oh, energy has to be stuck in here, right? But we don't measure the entire energy here, right? We only measure the energy of the, the products minus the energy of the reactants. And, and yeah, this system here shows nicely how the energy flows in and out depending and so. And then to how to determine whether something is, is exothermic or endothermic. Okay, so when we come back, we're going to actually measure it and use it to determine energies of reactants and products.